It's the moment you've all been waiting for. The Keychron K3 has been in Kickstarter for quite some time now, and we finally get to test it out and review it, determine whether it's worth it or not, how it compares to the Keychron K1 V4, and is it worth all the hype that people say it is? Sure, it's the first of its kind, the first low profile, hot swappable, and optical switch all in one, but we'll see. Does it amaze? Hey guys, this is Betty from Switch and Click and I got the Keychron K3 with me. I've had it for the past week and a half-ish now. I've been testing it pretty intensely, seeing if it is durable, gonna live a long time, worth using, worth purchasing. We got the K3 with the Keychron optical hot swappable switches in white. This is the really lightweight spring and linear switch option. And you'll see the typing test at the end if you wanna go check that out you can jump to it right now using the timeline or the timestamps down below like we always do so my first impression with this board after opening it is that it's super flimsy and it really pales in comparison to the k1 v4 in terms of build quality and that's one of the things that made us the most disappointed but i wanted to give it ample time on my desk with testing to really determine whether it would change my mind or not, or maybe it's more impressive than it looked. I wanted to give it a chance. And I'm gonna put this disclaimer right at the beginning, and it's that I typically don't like low profile keyboards. It feels like a laptop. It performs similar to a laptop and it just, it's not satisfying. It's not satisfying. It's not fun to use, but I'll try and review this from a more objective standpoint and sort of push my biases a little bit to the side but in the end it's my experience with the board basically all right let's jump into what's in the box you get the board itself and this is the star of the show so we'll toss that aside and talk about that a bunch later you get the full in-depth manual here and if this is your first keychron board you're going to want to look through it just a little bit to see exactly what your board can do what the indicators are things like that but if this isn't your first keychron board then you know it comes with a quick start guide that will show you exactly how to get it connected working right away get the rgb you want the backlight effect you want yeah i mean this this is basically all you need unless you need more details about the board it comes stock with the mac keycap so if you want to change that out to windows this will tell you how and it does come with the additional windows keycap a gray escape and a orange light key and as a bonus this has never been included in any other keychron board you also get two additional rubber bump-ons if you lose the one on the back here. Alongside that, it has a plastic recyclable dust cover here and it fits over your keyboard extremely nicely and very fitting. However, if you plan on using the dust cover while the keyboard is charging or plugged in, there will be some interference there because the dust cover does cover up the USB-C port. But if you don't use it, it is recyclable. I never use these. I do recommend you do use them because keyboards after a while can really attract hair and animal fur and all that stuff just stuff you don't really want to mess with you get the keychron branded wire keycap puller this is great to have just when you're pulling out keycaps on the low profile board the keycaps are spaced enough where you can just pull them out with your fingers but do that at your own risk so use this if you get the hot swappable version it does come with a metal switch puller as well but this tends to get pretty hard to use so i recommend you purchase one of these instead of using your little bitty fingertips to grab the switches you can now use more of a four-fingered grasp or even a fisted grasp and just have more power that way and more precision so get one of these things i'll link it down below you also get the black braided usb-c cable and at the end it is a straight cable instead of a right angle like you see on the regularly sized keychron boards and this is great because the usb-c port is at the back at the very middle not on the left side 
And that's pretty much for all that you get in the box. All right, so next we'll go into build quality, design, and layout at switch and click. We always start with the back of the keyboard, then the side, then the front. So at the back, you see that there's a gray plastic bottom case here. There's four rubber bump-ons. The two in the back are a little bit higher than the two in the front, and that gives the keyboard more of a incline. There are no kick up feet, no anything. That's pretty much it. If you lose your two rubber bump on here you can replace them with the two extra ones that they give you but i don't really see these coming out anytime soon i did try and peel them out just to see why they would give you two extras was that a concern that they had i don't think it was on the side you can see that there's a floating keycap design you can see these switches really clearly when the lights are on you can see the lights on clearly as well from all angles you can see the stabilizers and pretty much everything depending on the color of your switch you'll be able to see the stem of that switch on the back here you have the two toggle sliders on the top left corner one is for switching between mac and windows and the other is for switching on the power or the bluetooth via either cable or wireless depending on what you're doing you can also turn it off and these are now orange sliders instead of black on the k1 v4 they were black on black so the orange makes it a little bit easier to see just if you're fumbling at night or in a dim room or something like that again the usb-c port is straight in the middle here and i prefer that compared to the slightly off center look of the k1 v4 right next to the cable you also have a indicator of the battery status if it's green then that means it's fully charged if it's red it means that it's not fully charged and it may need some charging that charging light also shines straight under the F8 key and that is a pretty strong glow. You're gonna be able to see that if the rear keyboard is just on your desk, you'll see like a green light emit forward or a red light. And you also see a little bit of that light bleed through the F8 keycap. All right, so that was pretty much the design of the board. In terms of build quality, it is super flimsy. It's really lightweight. I weighed it at around 392 grams with just a little bit of manual force you are going to get quite a bit of flexing on your keyboard much more than you would get on the thick aluminum reinforced frame of the k1 v4 i don't know how to say this but we did drop our board it was from about three and a half feet i had my keyboard laying to the side of my desk while i was doing some other work and i guess overnight indy the cat she you know she likes to to flick things off the table she likes to knock things out she likes to just paw at things but she does what she does she has fun with it so she knocked it over and upon discovery we noticed that the bottom left corner the top case had separated itself from the bottom case and there was just a little bit of gapping there but it didn't seem like too much of an issue we just pushed it back together and everything was working the control works the option works the command works no problems there but that is a concern i mean just a small drop like that and the case is separating itself already we already know it's flimsy we already know it's flexible but for the top to separate from the bottom from just a small fall like that is pretty concerning but the point is it still works so i guess it's okay why well, go from the k1 v4 with the pretty thick aluminum case to the k3 which has a primarily plastic case with a super duper duper thin aluminum frame on top the difference is just too significant for me to ignore for me when i first heard the k3 was coming out i thought they would just take everything from the k1 v4 chop it up and splice it to make the k3 except with you know the switch upgrades from what i can see there's been a significant decrease in the build quality and probably the durability of the board for the long term it's also super lightweight I'm thinking that they wanted to make this ultra portable, hence the ultra slim. You can throw it in your backpack, you can throw it in your purse, you can take it places. As for the layout, it is a 75% and a 75% just means take a TKL, a 10 keyless board and take out a few keys and like smash it all into a small compact design. There's no spacing between the function row. There's no spacing between the arrow keys and everything else. All the nav keys are pretty much smushed together. On a TKL, you get a lot of extra space here between the function rows and 
stuff like that. But the function of both boards is around the same. On the 75%, you do have to use a little more of the secondary layers to really get what you want to get at. The case from the side has a slight angle. It's fairly comfortable to use, especially when you're gaming. When I'm gaming, I tend to rest my wrist on the table. And with the low profile nature of this board, your wrist barely has to go into any extension. For typing, it's also pretty comfortable. You can hover just a little bit or you can rest your wrist on the table. It doesn't make much of a difference, but there is just a slight angle there. Onto the keycaps of the board and the keycaps of the board are are pretty much everything. They're very Keychron-esque. There's that two-tone light gray, dark gray. There's the orange. They are ABS double shot plastic with shine through. So if you're using this for a pretty long time, a lot of the time it's gonna develop finger oils and nasty grime over time. These are also extremely thin keycaps but the shine through and the legends are very nice. It looks super clean. One difference between the K3 keycaps versus the K1 V4 is that the switches here have a cross-shaped stem, therefore the keycaps do as well. And by doing that, perhaps you can also take some regular profile keycaps and put them onto here and see what happens. In fact, let's do that right now. All right, so I have a cherry profile Y and a backspace. So, you can place normal keycaps on this board. It just looks a little bit silly. However, the keys with stabilizers aren't going to fit because these are specially made stabilizers for low profile keycaps. So the backspace ended up not being able to fit, but the Y sure does. And you can even press it and it moves pretty much the same distance as the low profile keycap. It just looks a little weird. But if you do choose to do that, keep in mind that your stabilized keys aren't going to be able to be changed. And those keys are the left shift, space bar, backspace, and enter. The legends are super, super duper clean, like all the Keychron boards have been. Their font is very crispy. It's thick enough with the RGB shine through to see at night. And the symbols on the Mac function row are very big, easy to see, all closed letters, very clean. My favorite are page up and page down, super satisfying to read. I just don't like that the keycaps are flimsy and that they use stabilizers that would make it almost impossible to put put other keycaps on there. So if you want to remap the keys on this board, for example, you don't like the way that delete is placed or page up, page down, home, and the screenshot key, maybe you never use screenshot key and you wanna replace it to something else. Keychron doesn't have their own software for doing this yet, but you can use Carabiner on Mac or Sharp Keys on Windows. I've done that personally, it works pretty well. However, it doesn't go onto the board, it happens directly on your system and it'll carry those settings over to pretty much every keyboard that you switch onto your PC and you cannot remap the top right corner lighting key. All right, onto the switches. So the switches we got are the Keychron low profile optical white linear switches, quite a mouthful. They are hot swappable, but it's pretty hard to take out. It requires a bit of finessing and a lot of clamping force on your hand part. But I can take out a keycap for you guys, take it apart and we can discuss it. The benefit of this keyboard being hot swappable is that if you have a switch that is chattering, breaking, not working properly, then you can just pull it out and replace it with something else. Or if you want to try out different Keychron low profile optical hot swappable switches, then you can do that as well. But I wouldn't do it too many times. The keyboard's already pretty flimsy. And on our K6 that we got a while back that was hot swappable, it's been through a lot of hot swaps and right now it's, uh, it's not working. Right now our K6 isn't working and I believe that's because we've swapped it out too many times. So just keep that in mind. You don't wanna swap something out too much. So it requires a bit of force on your part. Try not to let the switches fling everywhere. Might lose one. But the switch, you can see there's a cross shaped stem on the very top. The stem is pretty wide. It's very similar to like a gigantic box switch. You're not gonna be able to use a switch opener to open this. You can use either your fingertips or a flat tip screw driver but it's pretty easy to take out if you just lodge your nail under there while trying to hold it open. One thing to keep in mind is that the top housing is extremely thin and flimsy. The stem is pretty durable and then the spring is pretty small as well. There's a small 
rubber part here on the stem that you absolutely do not want to lose. And the reason for that is because it's an optical switch. So there's a light that needs to be blocked when your switch is being pressed. And that rubber part here is pretty much doing the blocking. It goes into a small hole on the bottom housing and does that. So if you do want to mod your switches in any way, don't lose that piece. You wanna make sure that that piece goes into the hole and can actuate before you close your switch. Now that's the switch. We got the lightweight one. It's pretty lightweight, but it feels really good. It's pretty smooth. There's a little bit of stem wobble. So if you put your finger on the keycap and just move it around, there's definitely a lot of movement there and that adds some additional noise. There's a bit of rattle in these switches for sure. The linear switches don't get stuck anywhere, even though like I could hit a keycap at a corner here. On the tactile switches on the K1V4, I was getting stuck a lot if I hit it on a corner or an incorrect angle. But on this, I've had no problems. Lightweightness and the reduced key travel does increase my typos quite a bit. But if you're willing to stick it out and get used to it and really love enjoy typing on it, then I doubt that's going to be a problem. This board does make a little bit more noise than my macbook air does when i'm typing it also has more distance to travel and it feels more responsive as well but it's still not super satisfying compared to a regular board but it's super portable so that's a major benefit onto the stabilizers the stabilizers don't sound any different than the other keys I'm do a quick quick demo right now of the stabilizers and you can see what i'm talking about this is what a normal switch sounds like and these are the stabilizers. So only a little bit more noise, but you can't really tell all that much. You can hear the rattle in the keys and the stabilizers do have cross shaped stems. However, they're like more square shaped and only fit a very specific keycap that's meant to fit into them. They're okay. You can see that they're also pre-lubed as well if you look super closely after taking off your keycap and it helps a little bit. It sounds pretty decent. All right, so some additional features of the board. You should know a lot of this already, but it does have Bluetooth 5.0. It can connect up to three devices really easily by holding FN and either one, two, or three to change from device to device. It's got Mac and Windows compatibility by using the slide toggle here at the top left corner. On a Windows computer, which is what I'm using, the function row without holding anything acts as the function row. So if you press F5, it's going to refresh your browser. However, if you hold FN and press F5, it will decrease the brightness of your board. So holding FN on a Windows computer will let you access those secondary functions. On a Mac, I believe it's the direct opposite. So without holding anything and you press the function row, you get the function. But if you hold FN, then you get F1 through F12. Now, if you want to switch those rows, there is a key combination that you can use to do that. And that is FN and X and L for four seconds. And that will switch what that does on a Windows computer. On a Mac, you have to go into settings and you know, just, just read your manual. The caps lock glows red when it's on and the normal color when it's off. You can see the battery charging indicator on F8 or the light beneath it. Alongside that, it's got a 1550 milliampere battery. It's going to be able to last about two weeks-ish with the backlight turned off and about three days-ish with the backlight turned on. And that just depends on how bright it is, how often you use it, if you let it go to sleep often, things like that. So you can test it out, but that's what they say. So far, I've had no problems with the battery, but I connect it often if I'm playing games. I don't recommend playing games on Bluetooth, especially if it's something that requires a fast response time like a MOBA or an FPS. If you're playing a casual RPG or something like Stardew Valley, then feel free to play on Bluetooth. The backlight is available with a ton of different presets. We got the white backlight, so it's pretty boring going through those presets, but if you got the RGB one, it goes through a lot of different effects and you can cycle through the different colors that you can put it at. And that's pretty much it for the board. If you have any additional questions, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments down below. I tend to record reply we're going to jump to the typing test right now and then the verdict after typing tests go
All right, that was the typing test. It sounded a little bit rattly, but not too bad. It's not very loud at all compared to a regular linear mechanical keyboard. It's pretty quiet, but not as quiet as just a MacBook Air. So if you're at the library, class, things like that, I wouldn't be typing away your notes on this thing because you're probably going to get some funny looks. So what's a verdict on the Keychron K3? It was pretty affordable. It has a lot of nice features, Bluetooth, Mac compatibility, backlight, all that good stuff, but it's so flimsy. I can't with good conscience recommend a board that's so flimsy that I really don't believe will last longer than a year of like going places with it, using it, turning it on and off, using the hot swappable feature, things like that. I would rather recommend the K1 V4 that they've put many iterations into it. It's got a super durable frame, dropped it with no issues. This has its cons too though, such as the keycaps and the switches. It only uses the weird two prong looking keycaps because that's what the stem looks like. Everything's got its pros and cons, but if you're looking for something that's super duper lightweight and portable, maybe going to have to be replaced in a year or so, the K3 isn't a bad choice. It's just not what I would use and not what I would recommend. You can check out the K3 using the links down below if you want. I believe it's in pre-order right now, depending on when you watch this video. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. I will link you to the K1 V4 review right here if you want to check that out. And then uh, if you want a K3 versus K1 V4, just like side by side comparison, comment that down below and maybe I'll make a video on it pretty soon too. Bye!